welcome to Classical Mechanics 2. In this video, we'll explore the orbital mechanics that come from central force potentials. We'll start by deriving the general equation for the orbit, then focus on the specific orbits you get from inverse square law potentials. The equation of motion for these systems is given by mu r double dot as equal to minus d by dr of the effective potential, where the effective potential is given by the central potential plus the angular momentum squared divided by 2 mu times r squared, where mu is the reduced mass. Since energy is conserved in this system, we can analyze this the same way we would a regular potential energy landscape. Imagine I start with a total energy E1, which is greater than zero. This corresponds to an unbounded orbit because I only have one turning point in the system. That is a place where there is all potential and no kinetic energy. And this is at the distance of closest approach. Since there's only one minimum, this orbit is called unbounded. Often solutions like this are called scattering states and their orbits look like this. If I start far away from the origin, I have mostly kinetic energy. Then I start slowly moving up the potential energy well, trading kinetic energy for potential energy. Then I reach the minimum radius where I have all potential energy and no kinetic energy, and I turn around and head back away from the origin again. Now imagine I have a system with total energy E2, which is less than zero. This corresponds to a bounded orbit, because now I have two turning points in my system, one at R min and the other at R max, and my particle is going to oscillate back and forth in this well between them. If we have inverse square law potentials, then bounded orbits are elliptical. This is nice because there's a single position along the orbit where I'm at a distance r min and a single point where I'm at distance r max. Then the particle just traces out this conic section forever. Since after traveling one period in this orbit, the particle returns to the place it started from, this is called a closed orbit. Potentials that are not inverse square laws or hooking potentials generally do not close. For such a general potential, there might be many points along the orbit where the particle is at the distance of closest or furthest approach. There is not typically a place where these orbits repeat themselves, so we say these orbits do not close. For example, the orbit of Mercury isn't closed. The calculation of the precession of Mercury was actually a big clue that there might be some problem with the Newtonian formulation of gravity. Eventually, the framework of general relativity would go on to explain the observed orbits of Mercury and the other planets, as well as objects near black holes. Now that we know what behaviors to expect from the orbits, let's have a go at solving them analytically. We'll start with the equation for an orbit in a generic central force. The force in the r direction, mu r double dot, is equal to minus d by dr of the effective potential, where u effective is equal to the potential coming from the central force plus the angular momentum divided by twice mu times r squared. The second term is the potential coming from the conserved angular momentum. If we wrote this as a standard Newtonian force, we'd find that the force in the r direction is given by the centripetal force L squared over mu r cubed plus the central force. We'll use this to solve for the shape of the orbit, which is r as a function of theta. And we're going to do that using two substitutions. The first substitution we're going to make is a u substitution, where u is equal to 1 over r, or equivalently, r is equal to 1 over u. For the second substitution, we want to change our time derivatives to angular derivatives, and we'll do this using the chain rule. d by dt is equal to d theta by dt times d by d theta, or theta dot times d by d theta. Since angular momentum is conserved, theta dot is a constant, and we can rewrite it as the angular momentum divided by mu r squared. Then when we include our first substitution, the time derivative d by dt becomes l u squared over mu times d by d theta. Now that we've got our transformations, we'll look at some terms. First, r dot is equal to d by dt of 1 over u. We'll replace d by dt with the definition of our angular derivative, and we get l u squared over mu times d by d theta of 1 over u. 
when we take the theta derivative, we get L u squared over mu times minus one over u squared times du by d theta. And this simplifies down to minus L over mu times du by d theta. To get the acceleration of r, r double dot, we need to take the time derivative of r dot. The time derivative becomes l u squared over mu times d by d theta, and r dot we just found out is minus l over mu times du by d theta. We can pull out the constant terms and we get that r double dot is equal to minus l squared u squared over mu squared times d squared u by d theta squared. Then our equation of motion becomes minus mu times r double dot, which is equal to l squared u squared over mu squared times d squared u by d theta squared. This is equal equal to the centripetal force L squared over mu times u cubed plus the central force as a function of u. If I divide through by these constants, I end up with u double prime of theta is equal to minus u of theta minus mu divided by the angular momentum squared times u of theta squared times the central force as a function of u. For the rest of this video, we'll be focusing on inverse square law forces. This gives us Kepler orbits for Newtonian gravity and the bound state of the hydrogen atom for electrostatics. Although I'll be working with the gravitational system, all of these ideas directly apply to the electrostatic analog. The gravitational force is given by minus g times the mass of one object times the mass of the other object divided by their separation squared. Instead of writing out this whole prefactor, I'm going to simply combine it into a single constant I'll call gamma. Then in our transformed coordinates, the gravitational force is given by minus gamma u squared. Then the equation of motion for this orbit is given by u double prime is equal to minus u minus mu divided by L squared times u squared times minus gamma times u squared. The two u squared terms cancel out and we're left with minus u plus some constant, which is gamma mu divided by L squared. And this constant is comparing the strength of the radial gravitational force to that of the angular acceleration. And this term has units one over length. Pay attention to it because we'll be returning back to it in the future. To solve this equation, we just need to make the substitution w equals u minus the constant gamma mu over L squared. And this reduces to the equation for a simple harmonic oscillator. So w of theta is equal to some constant a, which has uh, some constant a times cosine theta minus delta. Most of the time we can choose a coordinate system so that delta is equal to zero. Then u of theta is equal to gamma mu over L squared plus our constant a times cosine theta. And a is just a constant of integration, so I can factor it out. But I end up with u of theta is equal to gamma mu over L squared times one plus some constant epsilon cosine theta. Since both a and gamma mu over L squared both have units of length, epsilon is a dimensionless parameter called the eccentricity of the orbit. The eccentricity describes the shape of a particular orbit. The rest of this video is about the shape of the orbit. So I'll replace this constant out front with one over C where C has units of length. Then the equation for my orbit is r as a function of theta equals c divided by 1 plus epsilon cosine theta. To explore the shape of the orbits we can get, let's look at what happens when we vary the parameter epsilon. Cosine theta ranges from minus 1 to 1, which means that when epsilon is less than 1, then this term in the denominator is always greater than 0. On the other hand, when epsilon is greater than 1, then there is some epsilon for which this denominator is equal to 0, which means the radius of the orbit goes to infinity. When epsilon is less than 1, we have a bound orbit. And when epsilon is greater than or equal to 1, the orbit is unbounded. We'll start with the first case where the orbit is bounded. 
The distance of closest approach occurs when the denominator is the largest it can be, which happens at theta equals zero, or r min is equal to c divided by one plus epsilon. Equivalently, the maximum occurs at c divided by one minus epsilon. And the orbit has this behavior where I'm plotting r over c as a function of theta. We start at theta equals zero at r min, then at theta equals pi, we end up at r max, and this behavior continues cyclically forever. The distance of closest approach is called perigee, and the distance of farthest approach is called apogee. Plotting this instead in polar coordinates gives us an elliptical orbit. The shape of this orbit can also be defined implicitly in terms of these parameters. A is the semi-major axis of the ellipse, which is half the total length of the ellipse, and B is the semi-minor axis, which is half the total width of the ellipse. D is the distance from the center of the ellipse to the origin of the coordinate system. In terms of these constants, the implicit equation for our ellipse is given by x plus d quantity squared divided by a squared plus y squared over b squared is equal to 1. For unbounded orbits, epsilon is greater than or equal to 1. When epsilon is strictly greater than 1, we have hyperbolic orbits. Here, the radius diverges when the denominator 1 over epsilon plus cosine theta is equal to 0. This tells us that the maximum angle we can get is the inverse cosine of minus 1 over epsilon. As we approach theta max, the orbit asymptotically approaches infinity. Again, we can relate the implicit function for the hyperbola to geometric distances in the problem. Here, a is the distance between the point of closest approach and the intersection of the asymptotic lines. b is the distance from the point of closest approach to the asymptotic line in the y direction, and d is the distance from the origin to the intersection of the asymptotic lines. The implicit formula for the hyperbola is x minus d squared divided by a squared plus y squared over b squared is equal to minus 1. When epsilon is equal to 1, we have a parabolic orbit. This occurs with probability measure 0. In this case, the radius diverges when theta is equal to plus or minus pi. The implicit equation for a parabola is y squared equals k squared minus 2kx. Let's have a look at how the eccentricity of an orbit, or how the parameter epsilon, affects the total energy of the system. At the distance of closest approach, the total energy is u effective at r min. That's because at the distance of closest approach, the particle is changing directions, which means that there is no kinetic energy at this point, and the distance of closest approach is equal to our constant c divided by 1 plus epsilon, where c is equal to the angular momentum squared divided by gamma times mu. Then the total energy of the system is equal to the effective potential evaluated at r min, which is equal to minus gamma over r min, which is the energy coming from the inverse square law potential, plus L squared over 2 mu r min squared, which is the energy coming from the angular motion of the system. First, I'll pull a factor of 1 half r min out, and I get 1 over 2 r min times the angular momentum squared divided by mu r min minus 2 gamma. Now let me plug in the definition of r min, and I get this rather nasty expression. And I'm going to cancel out the factors of L squared of mu, and I'm going to pull the factor of 1 plus epsilon out front. And I end up with this somewhat simplified equation of gamma mu divided by 2 L squared times 1 plus epsilon times gamma times 1 plus epsilon minus 2 gamma. This tells me that my total energy is proportional to epsilon squared minus 1. For the total energy to be greater than zero, then epsilon squared minus one must be greater than zero, which means that epsilon is greater than one. And this corresponds to an unbounded orbit. When the total energy is zero, epsilon is equal to one, and we end up with a parabolic orbit. And lastly, when the energy is less than zero, we have epsilon squared is less than one or epsilon ranges between zero and one. This results in an elliptic orbit. I'll summarize all the results we've just derived into this chart. 
When I have an eccentricity equal to zero, the energy is less than zero, which means I have a bound orbit and the orbit is circular. When the eccentricity ranges between zero and one, the orbit is elliptical and the energy is negative. When the eccentricity is equal to one, the energy is exactly zero and the orbit is parabolic. And finally, when the eccentricity is greater than one, the energy is positive and we have a hyperbolic orbit. In the next video, we'll look at what happens when you inject energy into an orbit, for example, if you're a rocket and you want to change orbits. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.